Okay, um, hello everybody. Good afternoon. Um, welcome back to uh, some week of the semester. Um, okay, apparently this is week six. Uh, I'm talking about that. Um, I guess just on the administrative side here, um, so exercise five is due this week. Again, as, as these videos are premiering, I don't know when you're watching them. Assignment one, the week after, uh, I think it might actually be uh, the next Monday, but in my mind, assignment one's due in week seven. And then midterm in week eight, um, well, and then we get a break. So just so you know, like we're taking a bit of a an exercise slowdown here. Um, uh, hopefully that timing works out. Um, so depending how things work, I, I might have to push some of those exercises a week, um, but I'll stay with them as they are for now. Um, and once again, just where we are in the semester, we're in the middle third. Um, is that right? Week six? Yeah, it's the middle, the third, the middle of the semester almost. So yeah. Um, again, like, uh, what is it about programming languages? Is the theme we're on? Last week I talked about just sort of, you know, language stuff, implementations, um, just on on a higher level. We'll see a little bit more of those as we go on. Let's talk about some types. Um, so that was about logic. That last part again, like uh, what what we what I say, you know, imperative and functional, those kinds of things. Um, th this section is about well the data. Um, how to, and of course you've done this in programming languages. It's not a huge surprise. Um, you kind of. You know, there's a collection of types that you expect to have in a programming language. Like, you would be surprised if you came up uh, across some programming language and it didn't have the concept of an integer in it, right? Um, Booleans, integers, floating points, characters, strings. Um, I don't know, maybe some concept of references. You know, these things that, that you just kind of expect. Um, some languages, of course, make a point of having different sized integers. Some don't. All right, so if you're a... A C or a Rust programmer, you kind of expect to have a choice of how big your integer is. If you're a Python programmer, you just have an integer and it's whatever it is. Um, and then, I don't know, the next chapter of the tutorial for your programming language is compound types. Some concept of, you know, an array or a list, um, usually, again, depending on the language, obviously, um, but I'm thinking of the, the list in Haskell or an array in C where it's a bunch of values, but those values all have to have the same type. Um, of course, that's not enforced in a language like Python, JavaScript, Ruby. Um, in some sense, strings are a special name for the that, but of characters because there's just different kinds of operations you might do on a string. So maybe it makes sense to have it be a different type. Um, of course, in Haskell, we saw that it really was just a list of characters, and those two things were interchangeable. Um, I guess I hadn't mentioned sets in any programming language. Um, arrays and lists are, are thought of as ordered collections, and you can have duplicates in them. It's just how you, you know, you can have an array with a bunch of zeros in it. A set is thought of as unordered and without duplicates. So same as a set of the math course, and a lot of languages have some concept of a set where again you can say well you know what values have i seen and quickly look up um have i seen this value or not and add a add an element to that set um without worrying about any duplication um, in some sense this is what um so much of like 307 is about right the in insert and remove and search in a data structure maybe what you're talking about there is a set data structure um the other thing, the thing that is a tuple in Haskell or a struct in C, or I guess maybe a class even, um, the thing that is a, a collection of values that are somehow related, you know, the, the X, Y, and Z, or the first name and last name and age or whatever, where you have some distinct fields, um, maybe they're all different types, Maybe they're named as you'd expect in a struct. Maybe they're just kind of positional as you'd expect in a tuple, but you know, something like that. Again, most programming languages I can think of have something in that in that category. 
Um, and then the the value that is a uh, one of these things. Um, it's a, a num in C. I don't know if that's a thing you would have seen. It's not something I use a lot, um, but it's the again. It's, it's I have one of these things in this position. I need enough memory to store one of them, and maybe a bit to tell me which one I'm storing. Um, but I have to sort of make the choice when I when I have that value. Yeah, some languages have that. Some don't. Uh, like I said, an, in the object-oriented world, like in some ways. I think of an object as just a struct, but with functions too. But of course, that's um, unnecessarily argumentative. Uh, the way you work with objects and classes in an object-oriented language is quite different because it's what the language guides you to. So you have this concept of a class or an instance of it that's an object that has a bunch of, what I think attributes is probably the most common term there, but you know whatever you call it. And then the functions are kind of inside the data. So you have functions that implicitly work on an instance of the class and wh whatever other arguments you give them. You know, is that is that better than a struct with some functions that are kind of defined nearby? Well, like in some logical sense, I want to say no, but in a practical sense, yeah. I would much rather, like if I have to do it, I would rather define my data in an object-oriented class definition, it just feels like everything stays together a little better. Well, it's a little more obvious how to work with it too as a as somebody using a, a data structure. Um, I do want to point out, and especially as you get into object-oriented and classes, like it's very easy to, for me to talk about types and just say, oh yeah, 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 integers and strings and whatever. But the type system in a language can carry a lot of information on top of that, uh, like for example, like what are you allowed to do with this value? Um, so like a pointer in C is probably on most of our computers a 64-bit unsigned integer, and so is a 64-bit, well, maybe I should have said un long unsigned there, but you know, I could have two versions of 64-bit integer, one that I call a pointer and one that I call an integer Okay, so they might look exactly the same in the computer's memory. I could add one to both of them, but you know, it only makes sense to dereference one of them to follow the pointer to the thing. I, I can't take, or I shouldn't take the integer 17 and try to treat that like a memory address and go to that memory location to find something. So in that way, the type system, even though it's not, it, it's not sort of changing the um, the data that's stored. It's changing what the language is going to let me do with that, with that value, in a you know in the right way. Um, in Rust, there's uh, you know integers as you'd expect. I guess there's a 64-bit signed integer type I64 that most Rust programmers use for most stuff most of the time. Um, and I, I didn't. There's so many uh, amusing little details in the Rust reference. I just recently noticed, hey, there's this other thing. Um, so this is the wrapping type that holds a uh, signed 64-bit integer. So it's kind of this type, but with a little a little decoration on it. And what that decoration says is overflows cool. So usually as a programmer, like if I add one to a value, I expect to get the value that's one larger. And, and if I come up to the edges of this type and it's the largest possible value and I add one, I want the Rust equivalent of an exception thrown. I think that's a good default for a language, but you can sort of opt out of it. You can say, well, okay, instead of this, you know, instead of A being an I64, it's a wrapping I64. And that just, that's your way of saying, you know, I've thought about it and I'm, I'm cool if overflows happen. Don't, don't worry about me. It's probably not, it's probably not something I want as the default, but maybe sometimes it's right. Cool. Again, Good thing for a language to have, good thing for the the type of a value to let me express as a programmer. Um, I guess on that subject, there's a question of what type is, is it? Um, and I'll make a distinction here between a value and a variable. So in this Python code, these values have a well-defined type. Right? So this is three, the floating point, and I guess because it's Python example, I know it's a double precision floating point because that's what the language does. Um, this is a string of 
Unicode characters that, you know, I get has a bunch of methods and whatever in it. The variable X has two different types in the in these two lines of code. So again, the values have a, a type, at least in this language, the variables in again, in this example of a programming language um, can have different types as you go through the code. As a Python programmer, you consider that, you know, a feature. It's the way the world should work. Um, it can make code hard to read um, or maybe hard to reason about. So some code like this, again, perfectly legal Python code, the argument is well, whatever the programmer gives me, the, there's no restrictions on the types in the language. So somebody calls my function, they put a value there. Okay, my function's going to run. And then as long as, I guess, as long as whatever that is can have the plus sign put between two examples of it, this function is going to work. Um, so this function call will print 10, this function call will print ABC, ABC, because the result of adding two strings together is concatenating, the result of adding two integers together is adding. Um, that means that if I just look at this function on its own, it's kind of tricky to reason about what it does because it might do so many things, right? Like this might be, I might get this function called with some object, object that has the um, plus operator overloaded to do some crazy thing, well, that's the crazy thing that's going to happen when this line of code runs. Again, in Python, that's considered the the, the feature, right? I, I do have a function that's very flexible. So in this code, obviously, the language doesn't know what kind of plus that is until we actually get to that line of code, and in fact, get to that line of code every time it runs. So at, at compile time, it's just, uh, I don't know, there's a plus there. Uh, we'll do whatever plus means on these values when we get to this line. That's all the Python compiler could possibly know because it's all there is to know in Python code. Um, so that's a dynamically typed language. The types of those values aren't known until, uh, until the code runs, until you get to that line of code, the, the compiler can't check, the compiler can't enforce anything about the types. All it can do is when the code runs, maybe do the checks then. Um, you will have experience, I think, in at least some statically typed language. It's probably C or C++, might be Java, might be C Sharp. Um, in all of those languages, you know for sure, right? If I, if I had to write a function like this in Java, uh, I guess first I would have to call it a method, um, but I would have to give a type there. I would have to say, this is an integer argument. And then the compiler, again, faced with the analogous Java code to that, would have to say uh, type error. Like it would fail, have to fail to compile because, okay, if I've said my argument has to be an integer, that's fine and the second one isn't. So there's this question of kind of, um, how much checking do I have? And we saw like Haskell kind of being in between a little bit. Um, so a function like this, I've given the most general possible type class for it. Um, I, I need a type. Well, so all of these types have to be the same because multiplication and addition both demand the same type on either, you know, for either operand. Um, and well, I. I, I can restrict this to be, well, I have to restrict this to be something where multiplication and addition work. And that's the num numeric type class. So I can say that. And so now I have either one function that takes multiple types of argument, or I have multiple functions, like one for each type of argument I might ever put into it. I think you could imagine it being whichever one you like. Um, so certainly this function will take integers, it will take doubles. I think you know that much Haskell. Um, again, is it one function? Is it many functions? When the, sort of when the compiler is done with it, I don't know. But I do know if I get it wrong, the compiler is going to complain. Um, oh, and I guess the other thing that's happening here in this example is this five is an int five. This five is a double five because it, the types have to match it says so right here, the two arguments have to be of the same type. So the sort of literal um, numeric value, if I type it, 
it's a numeric thing, but it's not clear which numeric thing. Um, whoops. What's going on? Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, and so in fact, the type inference does exactly that in GHCI. It, if I just give it something that to my mind looks like an integer, it says it's some kind of number, might be a complex number, might be a double, might be an int, might be an integer, might be who knows whatever else. Something with a fractional, uh, with a, a decimal part is fractional. It might be a single precision floating point, it might be a double precision floating point, it might be complex, it might be something else, but it's definitely in the fractional type class. So Haskell seems like it sits somewhere in between here. Um, now, if our question is about type checking, which is what, what it is when we're talking about static and dynamic typing, we know that Haskell can check, like Haskell can ensure at compile time that we've used our functions correctly. That, that's its whole bit. That's why we have these type signatures or why it infers the type signatures if we don't get them explicitly. It's great. Um, like I said, I, I think the real question here is, can the compiler tell me I'm being stupid when I'm being stupid? <clears throat> so you know, if, I, if I divide two things, well, in Python, as far as the compiler is concerned, that's perfectly legal Python code with no follow-up questions. I, I, I have an, op, a, an operation that can happen at runtime, try to divide these two things. If they're dividable, at runtime, great. If not, throw an exception then. In um, C sharp, well, we, we're going to know at compile time, are these two things types for which the slash operator has been defined? Um, I assume you can do operator overloading in C sharp, although I don't know for sure. Um, you know, if they're doubles, great, fine. Um, so you get that sort of confident like you know you haven't made this kind of error you know you haven't made this error of of passing the wrong uh, argument type into a function and that's great um on the other hand I, like in these i guess i haven't i don't have a, a c example or a java example back here um but of course as you know um when you're writing c and java and, and c plus plus and whatever you end up specifying types all over the place. You have to say int i. You can't just t start talking about the variable i. Okay, so I had to type that, you know, that type signature in my function or in my variable declaration or whatever. Um, I don't want to do that. That's extra work I have to do as a person. Um, in a dynamic language, I have that flexibility. Um, again, a Python programmer thinks this is an example of why uh, Python is great. I can have I can put whatever type I want in here, and as long as it um, works, then it's a perfectly legal argument to this function. And if somebody wants to call my function with a type I've never heard of before, I have no reason to know it exists. It's part of their project. As long as it works, it's it's a perfectly legal function argument. Um, somebody who is a you know a an, a passionate C plus plus programmer would think that's disgusting. Um, and that the compiler should be able to check and should be able to slap our hands if we get it wrong. Um, I don't think either one of those is a bad position to take. Um, I guess the one thing I will say is like my experience as a programmer is certainly not that I don't make errors, but in, I don't make that error. Like I, it just isn't, it's very rarely the thing I do uh, in order to make my code wrong is like, oh, argument three to this function was supposed to be an integer, but I gave it a string. Um, maybe I just confused my function arguments and I put them in the wrong order and a static type check would catch it, but the, the, I don't make type errors. I don't think very much. I usually am happy to take this trade off of, well, I don't want to specify the types. So I'm not worried about catching that error because I think I'm cool, usually most of the time. Um, I think like I, I don't quantify the errors I make as a programmer. Um, oh, sorry, I was going back for the example I wanted. It's one slide away forward. Um, so this sort of polymorphic function in dynamically typed languages is fine. And polymorphic here is this is a function that can take many different types of arguments and 
return different types. Um, so in, in Python, it's sort of automatic. And this again, the same is true in uh, JavaScript and Ruby and other um, dynamically typed languages. I don't have to specify types, so I haven't specified types, so the compiler will accept whatever type. Um, and that's cool. In you know these more strictly statically typed languages, um, I maybe have to start playing games with uh, type classes in Haskell or interfaces in Rust and Go, or you know, in something like C, well, if I want a function that will add three integers, I have to write that. And then I can write a different function that adds three floats and a different function that concatenates three strings. Those are completely different operations and I have to write that code three times if I want it. Uh, again, maybe you think that's a good thing so the compiler can enforce um, that, that type on the part of whoever's calling the function. Maybe you think it's bad. I, I, again, I think perfectly reasonable judgment call either way. Um, there are still runtime checks, and I think some. It's again, it's easy to look at something like you know C and Java and C sharp and say, well, it catches type errors. Well, it catches some, most even, but you know, like I, I can't determine at runtime if some counter that's c calculated in some really complex way exceeds the you know if I have an array of a hundred, how do I know I didn't look for element one hundred and one? That's still a runtime check. It's not something a compiler can catch in general. Or again, if I do some calculation and I happen to go past maxint, um, maybe the compiler could find it in the easy cases, but in general it can't. The halting problem is is just um, unavoidable. So uh, do I want my compiler to be able to find these errors for me? Is it worth a trade-off? I don't know. And of course, we, we don't all agree because that's why languages in either category exist. If there was a right answer, like if static was the right answer, dynamic languages wouldn't exist. Obviously they both have their purpose. So you might have seen other languages that are sort of in between here where you can give static types, but they're optional. And so this is, you know, maybe on my the constructor for my class, I want to make sure that that my my objects are created with the right contents. So on my constructor, I'm going to be explicit, and then for the other stuff, I'm pretty sure it'll it'll work out just fine, or something like that. So I can give the types, but don't have to. Uh, and something like TypeScript is an example here where I I could give a type, and if I give it, the compiler will check and enforce it. But if I don't, I guess we fall back to probably JavaScript behavior because TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript. Um, and then this, well, whatever type is cool um, because, well, that's just the, the, the default behavior for a variable, but I could if I want to. Um, there's another side to this. So I'm gonna at least kind of make the decision here about like what the compiler can notice and w tell us about and cause, you know, give us errors for. And then a subtly different concept, which is um, which definition is, is bound to the, the executable. So this is, again, not a question of what the type is, but what the operation is maybe. Um, so back here, a couple slides when I was adding, Again, what flavor of addition is that? Is that an integer addition or a floating point addition or a string concatenation or any one of a thousand other things? In Python, the answer is I don't know yet. And the only time I can figure it out uh, in Python is when I get to that line of code. It might be different types every time. It might be a thousand times I call that function and it's integers every time. And the thousand and first time I call that function, it's a floating point or strings or something. Um, again, so what kind of addition is that? Um, can we can we line up an uh, an integer add as a CPU instruction to perform that operation? In Python, the answer is no, not at compile time anyway, or not not when we what not when the compiler sees the code. Um, statically bound is the opposite of that, where again, if you think of something like Java or C, well. I, I had to specify the types of everything. I, I did statically type my code explicitly, 
so the C compiler knows, oh yeah, that's an at, that's an integer 64-bit addition because those are the types that are surrounding that plus sign. So it knows which implementation to use at compile time versus the implementation has to be figured out when the code runs. Um, so in Java, like maybe something like this, and again, if you don't know Java, fine, translate into some other language. These are completely different functions, right? Like somewhere in the world, there is a um, implementation of system.out.print that knows how to print a double and another one that knows how to print a string and they're, they're distinct functions. The compiler is in charge of figuring out, okay, do I have a version of this function that can take this type? Yes, okay, the, that's, the, that's the function we're calling on this line of code. Do I have a function that can take this type? Yes, okay, that's the, the function we're calling on that line of code. Um, that binding, again, which implementation am I talking about with that series of characters in my source code? It's figured out at compile time. In, uh, like I said, in Python, the answer is no, the compiler has no idea. It looks like from what I can see that that's about to be a, an integer addition. Um, but, you know, I've, I've left this ellipsis here. I don't know what code's hiding. Maybe A and B change types and become strings partway through this function. And then that is going to be string concatenation, or again, maybe my function is called with different inputs and that affects the way that line of code runs, whatever. Um, so what that implies is that more work has to be done while my code is running. Um, for C code, that, all, that question can be, can be worked out when the code compiles. For Python, it has to be figured out while the code is running. Um, that's, that's going to be a speed penalty, right? There's just more work has to happen at runtime. When my code's running, I want my logic to run. I don't want the language to be taking precious CPU cycles away to do other stuff. Um, again, in, for a, a statically typed language, that's already been dealt with. Um, at the expense of flexibility, right? Again, the C programmer has to write a separate function for the integer operation or the floating point operation or whatever. Um, again, which one do you like? Which one is better for your scenario or your code or whatever? Uh, I don't know. Depends on the on how how much how much you like writing the types in your code, how long you're willing to wait for it to run, everything else. Um, so yeah, it's runtime overhead is going to be a thing. I talk about a lot, and this is basically the the work that's happening while the code is running that isn't the part that I care about. Again, like in that example back there, a few slides, what I care about is adding those three things together. I care about the addition, and if it's a again, if it's an integer addition, fine. I need that work done. I don't like the the time the language spends trying to figure out what kind of addition I'm doing. Well, that's overhead. That's that's work I don't care about, but it does have to get done at some point. Um, and again, I, I, I will just call on your intuition here. Like if you've ever written assembly code, in C, uh, that plus sign is going to turn into an add instruction or a floating point add or whatever it is, one machine instruction. In Python, the analogous code is going to turn into, okay, when we get to this line of code, what type is A? Okay, what type is B? Okay, well, I, it's probably what type is A? Does it have an add operator definition for that type? Um, it's the double underscore add method on a type that would determine that. So look up to see if it has an add implementation. If it doesn't, maybe B does, and you can do the reverse add implementation. So find that and then call the method. And then that method call, you know, again, somewhere a, a layer of abstract abstraction or two away, it's actually going to do the add in like a machine instruction that adds two integers. That's a long story to tell. And it's sort of a corresponding amount of work for the computer to do as opposed to do an add instruction. So this is a story I thought I was telling when I started this Mandelbrot uh, example with um, Cython. Um, so um, Cython is a, a, a Python code to C transpiler, I guess. Um, 
it will take just normal, you know, everyday Python code and translate it to C code, kind of funny C code, but still C code, and then pass it in over to the, the C compiler. Um, and when I did that on this example, uh, again, we went from about 500 time units to about 350 time units. So for those who think like compiled code is fast and Python is interpreted and therefore Python is slow, um, which again is something you will hear people say and hear said online, almost everything I just said was wrong. Python is compiled, right? Uh, and as I talked about last week, the standard Python tools take this code and they compile it. They compile it to bytecode in exactly the same way that C Sharp and Java and um, what else is bytecode compiled? Haskell, I, I think. Uh, no, never mind. C Sharp and Java are bytecode compiled for sure. Python is bytecode compiled in exactly the same way and it runs kind of slow. Cython takes that exact same code, at least on, on this line, and native compiles it. So again, translates it to C and then that C gets compiled into machine code and it runs, okay, a tiny bit faster, but not much. Cython is, has like extensions to Python. Again, it's a, it's a superset of the language. And so the difference between these two tabs, um, again, I have this function, this is normal Python code. And I've just, you know, I've, I have, function arguments that are whatever type I give them, and I have variables that are whatever type I put in them. In Cython, uh, I can specify types. And I can say, I have I still have the same three arguments, but I'm going to say they're type double, double, and int. And this variable, instead of just being a normal Python variable, is explicitly a C double. And this one is explicitly an integer. And that's the only change. So the only change between these two files is, is that, um, static typing of those six values, uh, everything down here is unchanged. Everything here is unchanged. Like the way I express the logic is unchanged. But I get a, a 36 or whatever time speed up. Um, Python's not slow. It's not a slow language because it's interpreted, because it's not interpreted, it's compiled. Um, Languages like this go slow because of static uh, dynamic binding. At runtime, the code has to, uh, the Python runtime environment has to figure out what kind of star is that? Oh, it's a floating point multiplication. Okay, well, let's do that then. Uh, what kind of subtraction is that? Oh, it's a floating point subtraction. Okay, let's do that. What kind of comparison is that? Oh, it's a comparison between two floating point numbers. Okay, well, let's, let's do it then. Um, that takes time. And again, like I've chosen an example here for like the biggest possible, like, you know, I've gone out of my way to find a slow, you know, dramatic example, I guess. Um, most average code is not going to have that big a difference, but that's the, that's the, again, that this is, these two lines are the, the highlight I wanted to make when I started this whole stupid Mandelbrot example. Um, it's not compiling, it's static binding. That, that is the problem. Um, Cython actually does this this fun trick, and I, 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 I apologize for the color scheme. I don't think I can do much about it, but what is happening here is, um, so this is that, that source code, the thing I had over here with the type hints. So again, I, I have type hinted only this function not this function. This is much less on the critical path. The code is spending almost all of its time here. So I, I optimize there. I didn't optimize the stuff that, that doesn't matter. And the color scheme here, the like brighter yellow it is, the more lines of C code it turned into. So like if I look at this, uh, let's look at something a little less horrible. Eh, that'll do. Okay. <clears throat> so if you accept the fact that these are like machine generated ugly variable names, like if you just, if you can get past that and see this PYX underscore V underscore ZR and just read it as ZR, which is what I wrote in the code. Um, okay, so it's ZR times ZR plus this that uh, greater than four if. Oh, so that's exactly like if I was a C programmer, that's exactly the code I would have written. 
I, I would have spelled the variable names a little bit nicer. I, the, the not equal to zero is a funny addition there, but the the, op, the C compiler optimizer will will sort that out. And then of course this function has to return a Python value, so it has to like create that Python value as the return thing, and then and then return. Um, okay, there's a couple lines there, but that only runs once. Most of the time is spent doing these calculations where, again, I, it used a few extra temporary variables that if I was a programmer, I wouldn't have. Again, we'll, we'll lean on the C optimizer to take care of that. Otherwise, it wrote perfect, I guess, C code for that because it's typed. And it can, I guess maybe I should point out this line. Uh, okay, it's all, it's a bit of a mess here. But somewhere in here, uh, there it is, double. Right, so it creates double and integer variables for those things and then initializes them exactly like I would have done as a C programmer. So I guess it shouldn't be a surprise then, right? Like uh, over here, um, it, it shouldn't be a surprise that the Cython implementation and the C implementation both compiled with GCC-03 run it in about the same time. Of course they do, they're the same code. One has stupid variable names, but the compiler doesn't care about a stupid variable name. On the other hand, um, when we come down into the main function here, um, where there are no type hints, if I look at say this line, and again, sorry for the, this eye searing yellow, um, but this subtraction x max minus x min that again I wrote as a programmer, it turned into pi pi subtract those two things, which I I'm I'd be willing to bet money that there's a dynamic lookup involved there. It's not really subtraction; it's figure out which ones of these the minus operator can apply to, and then go and find that method and call the method and return the result. And then we have to do the the um, bounds checking two on that like is it, it did we get an overflow and if we did how do we deal with that so th that has to be tacked on the end of that as well i'm giving that up when i give the type hints for c code um this looks like worse code it looks like i have a lot of extra time taken and i do i don't know why why i don't know why they chose highlighter yellow for that um okay is that what i said um yeah the plus in in my python code turns into a plus in the c code which then of course turns into a, a floating point double precision add um uh, when the compiler gets a hold of it without the static typing it turns into a python dynamic type uh, dynamic binding kind of function call um and yes a question about optimization when I wrote this, when I turned the Python code into Cython code and I gave the type hints, I only did it here because I knew that almost all the running time for this code was in this loop because I understand the code. I didn't bother doing it down here. And I feel like it's, uh, people who are not experienced uh, like optimizing code would think, oh, you have to make it fast. You should do the same thing down here. Um, well, no, I damn don't. Um, it's exactly the same speed because that code ran for, you know, some tiny fraction of a percent of the total running time. It wasn't even enough to measure. Um, I happen to get, again, I think these two numbers are the same, right? There's a little statistical error in the fact that the Cython code happened to run a tiny bit faster that time. Um, but yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't waste your time optimizing code where it doesn't matter. And I guess the, the um, like this, this guidance here of profile is profiling in this context is figure out what code is running the most. Like this code is running for, you know, I, I would guess like, you know, 0.01% of the total runtime. This loop is running for the rest of it. I only care about that loop if I want to make the code faster. I'm not worried about the rest. I think in this case, I probably didn't profile. I just looked and I, I knew what was happening in the code. But anyway, um, the sharp eyed among you might have noticed here PyPy running dynamically typed, one would therefore assume dynamically bound Python code even faster. Again, probably within the statistical error, but, but right in there. 
Um, uh, once again, a reminder, PyPy is a just-in-time compiler for Python. So as the code is running, if I run it with PyPy, again, exactly the same code, I can type Python3 code.py or PyPy3 code.py. Um, it's sort of analyzing as we go, and it's saying, it's looking and saying, you know, it looks like this escapes function. It seems like A, you call it a lot. It's probably something we should just in time compile to make it go faster. And you know what? It looks like every time you call the function, it's got, you know, a double and a double and an int as its arguments. I think that's the right order. Yeah. And then that implies, uh, you know, if we look at what calculation is happening down the code here, okay, that's a double, and that implies, yeah, yeah, this is this is double precision floating point operations, and this is an integer, and then we do this comparison, and um, it can it can sort of use that observation as it's doing its just in time compilation, and create a statically bound version, and then all it has to do is say, well my function call now kind of implicitly will look like, well, do the types match the one I statically compiled for? Okay, cool. Um, then we'll just run the machine code. Um, if they don't, if if on the millionth time I call this function with different types, okay, well, we'll, we'll catch that and then we'll fall back to dynamically typed byte code or maybe we compile those types or something. A just-in-time compiler can play those tricks it can determine the static typing that I effectively have at runtime, um, and that's great. Um, yeah, and that's why, like, that's how, again, I, I haven't looked. Like, I have no proof of this assertion that PyPy is doing static, the statically bound compilation of this code other than this number over here in the rightmost column. I don't think it's I there's I don't think there's any way it's possible to have this number this small and and dynamically bind operations. It's gotta be statically binding. Um and of course what might be happening, again, I'm not sure in this code, um the uh I guess this this function call, the one that's actually calling here, I'm imagining might be effectively wrapped in this kind of logic if the types match. But the just-in-time compiler could, could kind of um, statically compile one level back too, right? Maybe it looks at this and says, you know what, this loop is get, getting a lot of attention too. We'll statically compile all of that and then move that if statement kind of up a level to, for this type checking. Uh, you know, if we get this far, we know the types of those arguments. Um, so we can move this kind of up a level in the call stack or something if you want to think of it that way. Um, that's great. Right, so I went back and forth on this decision where, you know, uh, do I do I like statically typing my things in my code? Sometimes it's nice. Sometimes it's nice to have the compiler check that. Um, I I'm more in favor of it if it gets me static binding at runtime. I guess at compile time, and then at runtime I don't have to worry about it. It makes my code go fast. So I like Cython, therefore. But then I saw what PyPy can do just in time. Well, I don't know anymore. I don't know if I want to write that or not. And obviously it's going to depend. Again, I've chosen like a really simple example here in a really simple scenario, but um, it it is just, in fact, it's delightful that these three lined up this way. Again, all at effectively the same time. Um, NIM, as I mentioned last week, NIM is a language that compile uh, transpiles through C. So this NIM code, translated probably pretty directly into C code that probably was handed to GCC, so I'm not surprised that those two take the same amount of time. Um, it looks like the, oh, okay. So certainly GCC-03 and GCC-03 with uh, Arch Native, there's no way this should be slower. So certainly anything like here and above is indistinguishable in runtime, because again, I'd be willing to bet that this command line switch on that code doesn't change the created assembly. This, those are the same. I'm, I'm confident. Um, but then JavaScript can run in the same time. That's mad. Like who, JavaScript shouldn't be fast. It's, it's dynamically typed. It has to be dynamically bound. It's got all these insane type decisions. Like JavaScript doesn't have an integer type. JavaScript just has number and it's it's integers or it's floating points or it's whatever you feel like using it as. There's no way that should be fast. 
but here we are. Um, I'm sorry, is there anything else type related that I want to point out in here? Um, I guess that's what hack is, right? So hack is, yeah, it's PHP, but with types. Uh, and I think it's a Facebook product because Facebook had a lot of um, PHP code that they needed to run fast. So they created this uh, uh, hip hop VM tool chain that can take PHP code and try to run it fast, but can also take typed PHP code, which is basically Cython to Python is as hack is to PHP. Um, and they get, again, at least in this example, it seems to, it lives up to its promise. And all of those things are running faster than Java that you thought was compiled and therefore fast. Um, all, all of these things are compiled. Some of them are compiled to native code. Usually some of them are compiled to byte code. Usually um, the Python runtime, or sorry, the Java runtime environments, um, they, they all have, um, they all have uh, just-in-time compilers. So they're they're playing the same game as, as something like PyPy, maybe, there's just something about them. They haven't received the same attention. Maybe there's some subtle difference I don't see that's making them, again, like a, a, a few percent slower on this one example. Um, or, right. So GraalVM is a um, LLVM bytecode runtime, like virtual machine. So I can take the C code, compile it to LLVM bytecode and run it in Graal. It's a tiny bit slower, but again, still, still pretty close. Um, the just-in-time compilers are fantastically good at what they do. Um, and I guess back to the point, back to what we're actually talking about, um, one of the things they can do is um, create a statically bound version, even though I thought my language was all dynamically bound and dynamically typed. That's that's cool. And again, I like that, um, especially if I already have a bunch of Python or PHP or something, I just want it to go faster. Uh, great. Turns out if you're Facebook, it's just cheaper to, to hire a bunch of compiler experts and get them to create just-in-time compilers for you than it is to rewrite your whole code base. Great. Um, is that... Um, okay, yeah, this is a good spot for a break. So let's, um, well, let's do that. I'll see you in a few minutes in another video.